darkness tries to roll over my bones and sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Sunrise. My name is Jake, and I'm one of the worship leaders here, and it's such an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> we love you fathers out there. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, my dad's here, and I'm just so proud to be his son. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, let's give another hand for the fathers out there. <laughs> so, um, I was kind of preparing for this morning and looking through Psalms, and um, this morning as I was doing that little devotional time, some words just kept popping up um, in the text, and I wanted to share them with you this morning, and they're just steadfast love. You know, that's the kind of love that God has for us. There's so many things in this life that are like shifting sand, and they, they aren't stable, and they're not secure, and if you're like me, from time to time, 
We try to find our security in things that actually aren't secure. If we really thought about it, we might, we might realize that, you know, what I'm putting my faith in, my hope in, it lets me down. But, you know, that's not true of God. He never lets us down. And any hope that we put in him is never disappointed. So that's why we're here to sing his praises this morning, because he's a good God and his love is steadfast. So join with me this morning just with a heart of gratitude and worship.
be seated. What do you love about your dad? I love him because he always lets me do fun stuff. Oh, he's awesome and he get he and every so often he gets us pizza. Ooh. He fixes everything. He's really caring and he's really strong. I love I love when my dad a friend with me. He's really nice. And he's the best dad ever. He makes us food. He's really fun and nice. He always plays soccer with me. And he always plays games with me. What I love about my dad is how kind he is and how he always tells us to help out when he's doing a project or when he's building. Um, well, he's really cool. He's awesome. He takes me out to dad time when I have a good day at school. I love my dad because he, because he makes food for me. Well, he buys us a lot of stuff. He cares about us. Uh, he provides us with the things we need. He's a, he's just he's a great dad. He's a great pastor. He's he's just he's always he's so he's just he's so nice, and he's just he's everything I can wish for. Um, I love my dad because because he's so nice. Um, what I love about my dad is that sometimes he takes us to go fishing or crabbing. I like how, um, the way he makes ramen. He lets us play on his switch. I love him because he lets me he, he play games with him and play soccer with me. He tickles me a lot, and it's actually gonna giggle me a lot. We like that he usually helps us with projects. He is nice to me, and he always lets me get food when I want, and he gives me toys when I like. And Papa. I really love him because he's Mama. such a nice daddy to me, and my little sister. I like how he does my Legos with me. He helped us paint. He makes yummy meat on the barbecue. My dad it helped me it get hot dog and pizza. He's um, cool and kind. I love dad. What's your favorite thing to do with your dad? Going to the theaters or going fishing. Just joking around, kind of having fun. Um, we also like to do puzzles like Sudoku or stuff like that together. Making funny faces. Go bowling. Uh, Go to the playground with him. Yeah. He takes me camping. Go to the store. Don't he spoils. He spoils me more than my mom. To play games with him and to build Legos and play soccer. It like a free and a kick kick. Go to the park with him. Play ball because I because I go to T ball. Play and watch Paw Patrol. Movies. And watch movies. That's one of my favorites too. And I go to the park with them. I see what they do to my dad in I only watch the wild away. Not with with him. I play there with him. <laughs> go to the mall and watch movies. Play board games. Probably cook meat with him. Um, playing soccer with him? Yeah. Play hide and seek. Getting Taco Bell drinks and like drinking them with him. I like watching movies with him. I like doing puzzles on his computer with him. I like 
I like playing board games with him. To go on Father's and Daughter's Days. We go to Oaks Park and we always escape together. Going in Krabby with my dad. I like to uh, play with him and sometimes he tickles me. Playing video games with him and playing soccer with him. Help him build stuff because he builds a lot of stuff in our backyard. Me too. Get the Frosties at Wendy. Uh, I love hugging him and doing a 1,000 piece puzzle. Um, play with him. And play with him. Oh, I see. Happy, Happy Father's Day! Day. Happy Father's Day! 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 Uh, it always hits me in the feelers on these types of videos with the kids uh, telling why they appreciate their parents. So everyone, uh, happy Father's Day, all the dads in the room, both uh, biological dads, spiritual dads, uh, all, we have come in all forms. So happy Father's Day. Let's give the dads in the room a hand if we could. My name is Jace Johnson. I'm the uh, serve director here at the church, and uh, I wanted to start us off with a prayer. I'm going to read you a, a prayer, so if you all could pray with me. Dear God, you have said reverence for God gives a man deep strength, and what we need today are men with deep strength. Help us to build our firm foundation on Jesus Christ. When everybody else is running the race for acquisition, achievements, accomplishments, and appearance. Help us to remember that what matters most is love. To love you and to love our wives, our kids, our families, our friends, and even our enemies. Help us to remember, Jesus, that you said our care for others is the measure of our greatness. Help us to give our lives away and learn what it means to really live we realize that everything else is going to pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. Most importantly, we pray you give these men a new sense of courage, the courage to stand alone, be a man of honor, be strong, and do everything in love. We pray these blessings in your name. Amen. Uh, our discipleship pathway that we have here at Sunrise Church, you hear about this every week. We connect with uh, God that loves us and others. We grow, we serve, and we lead. That applies to everybody here. Uh, this is not for men or women, but guess what? Today, we're going to focus on the guys, So, <laughs> since it's Father's Day. So uh, first thing we're going to do, though, is if you're new to the church, whether you're joining us online or here in the building, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. And if you would like to connect with us, if you have a prayer request, we have a QR code. You can point your phone at that uh, screen, the QR code up there, and it will take you to our Sunrise website where you will, you're able to uh, tell us who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself, and even drop a prayer request if you have it. Uh, one of the ways we connect with the men's ministry here at Sunrise is every second Saturday at 8 a.m. we have a men's breakfast. And as you heard by the video, we have some amazing cooks including one of our pastors, who is a great uh, ramen cook, apparently. So, <laughs> and Pastor Israel. <laughs> um, so if you uh, haven't uh, connected at one of our men's breakfasts, I can tell you the food is great and uh, the conversation is even better. So that's every second Saturday at 8 a.m. The next step on this discipleship pathway that is designed after Jesus' life is to grow. The, what, we need to, what we mean by grow is be in a community of other followers of Jesus Christ. And that happens throughout the week. We have Sunday at church, we gather together, but the other six days of the week are also important. We have several groups where you can get connected with other men, other women, uh, or co-ed groups. But the group I'm going to talk about today, we have a coffee and conversation group every morning that meets here at the church at 6.30. Uh, they drink coffee, fellowship together, talk about the lives, ups and downs, pray with one another. So if that's something of interest to you, you can always find our, connect, our, our grow area right outside this door to the left. 
small groups, anything that you uh, might have an interest in to fellowship with others, it's available. The next step in that discipleship pathway is serve. And uh, I'm the serve director here, like I mentioned. Today, we've actually got a booth out in the lobby where we're signing up people to adopt a space out here on our property to uh, do some landscaping, mowing, uh, taking care of flowers. So if you want to check that out, if that's uh, something that you're interested in, um, you know, taking care of the grounds and sunrise, you can get involved in that. We have some people out there at the booth that would love to talk to you and uh, walk you through how that looks. The last step in our discipleship pathway is to lead. And this is where you being a disciple become a di disciple maker. Uh, this is one of the deepest connections I've had at my time in following Jesus Christ is having a spiritual dad of sorts, which is a mentor. So we do have a mentoring program. If you're looking to mentor someone or be mentored yourself and find that maybe that spiritual brother or that spiritual father or uh, in, we have women's groups as well that do uh, mentoring. So Mike Keller is our uh, disciple or our mentoring coach, our man-to-man -man mentoring coach. You can find his email right there. And I can tell you just from my experience again that this was one of the most important parts of me following Jesus. Someone that had been doing this for a long time. I had questions. He had uh, most of the time answers, you know, and sometimes it was just a discussion back and forth. It just really grew me in my relationship with Jesus. So if you uh, are interested in having a mentor, I would suggest getting a hold of Mike there. If you're interested in being a mentor, get a hold of Mike. Uh, so that brings me to the end of my time up here. The, for the next minute, I want you to go ahead and greet someone around you. Uh, we're going to take a minute just uh, for our greeting time before Shane's up here with our message. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jacob's running, he's running, he's getting there. Okay, we officially start now. <laughs> All right, as, Jay, as Jace mentioned, I'm Shane and serve as one of the pastors here. It's uh, my delight to lead the next part of our worship gathering. For those of you in the room, welcome. Those of you who are joining online. And this next part is where we examine God's word together, or as I like prefer to say, we let God's word examine us. And that's really the theme behind the verse that we've been reciting together at the beginning of this, of this time. We do it each Sunday, so I invite you to stand back up, if you will. We're going to put this verse from 2 Timothy up on the screen. And again, a reminder of the power of the scriptures. And so let's go ahead and read this together out loud. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for your, for your scriptures. It tells the big story that you have been telling since the beginning of time, a story that, that will culminate in, some, in, in wonders. And so we're right here in the middle of it all, and we're seeking after you. So would you be with us this morning? Let your words speak to us and give us receptive hearts that we might hear what you have for us this morning. We pray and hope and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
As you're probably aware, we live in an age of anger. Pick any cause and you can quickly find others who are ready to share your outrage. And then we have social media, which seems perfectly designed to fan the flames of outrage by providing easy access to others who are ready to nurse, rehearse, and retweet your chosen grievance. We have Twitter mobs and real mobs who, who regularly demand with a righteous justice that their chosen enemy should be eliminated or cast aside in what has been called cancel culture. And churches haven't escaped the rage. Talk to any pastor, and especially over the last couple of years of the pandemic, and, and you'll hear story after story of conflict going on in the church and people angrily leaving church for reasons both large and small. Enemies. We all have them. They are a part of life. Some enemies last for a lifetime. Others are momentary. Now, I realize as soon as I say that all of us have enemies, some of you may protest. You're, you're much too nice to actually call someone an enemy. But if I could monitor your automatic, visceral body responses, I could tell you who your enemy is at any given point in time, whether that enemy is real or perceived. You see, we have an automated system in our bodies designed to recognize and respond to real or perceived enemies. It's called the autonomic nervous system. And it works something like this. You have five senses, and your five senses are constantly monitoring your environment. And then you have this part of your brain, it's called the amygdala, where they got that name, I don't know. But it's in the middle of your brain, and it's taking all these senses, and it's, looking, it's on alert for any danger. And when it perceives a threat of any kind, it sends a signals down your nervous system, down your spine to a couple of glands at the top of your kidneys. These glands then secrete hormones into your bloodstream called cortisol and adrenaline, and they amp your body up so that you could fight or that you can flee. It actually changes your body. Your, your pupils dilate so that you can see more. Your heart begins to beat faster and your breathing becomes more shallow because it gets oxygen. It pumps your, basically your blood full of oxygen. And then it re, your body actually prioritizes some parts over others. It, it deprioritizes things like Digestion. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, but it's not needed in a fight. And it sends your blood into, out into your extremities, into your arms, into your legs, so that you can be ready to respond to that enemy. It's known as your fight-flight response. And it's a wonderful, God-designed part of your body. It's a way to protect you and me from enemies. So today I want to focus in on the fight part of the fight-flight response. We call it anger. And if you pay attention to your anger, whether it's the mild versions we might call irritation or frustration, or the intense versions, rage, right? Pay attention to your anger, and at that point, you can, see, you can understand who your enemy is at that time. For example, how do you respond when your unreasonable, demanding boss comes barging into your cubicle, you know, whether you are working on something important or not? How do you respond when that coworker blames you for the problems that are going on in the project and they do so in front of the entire team? How do you respond when you have that neighbor, you know the one, who refuses to fix their dilapidated fence or take care of their lawn? Or... Do anything to stop their dog from barking every single morning at 6 a.m.? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we can bring this a little closer to home, literally. How do you respond when your husband or your wife or your mom or your dad don't act or respond in the way you want? Parents, you know, we've had a rather rainy spring and early summer, you know, how do you respond when your kids incessantly whine and complain and say how they're bored they are? We don't change, you know, we also experience it here in church. You have that member of that small group that you're in who seems to dominate the, the, the discussion every single week and the leader doesn't do anything about it. 
or when the pastor says something that uh, causes you outrage. Not that we would ever do such a thing. <laughs> now, you may protest and you may say, no, that person isn't actually my enemy, but here's the deal. Your body doesn't care. Whether it's a real or perceived enemy, it just responds as it was designed to respond. What we need is training to rightly conceive of our enemies and to train that, ang that anger impulse. And thankfully, we have a Bible story. It's in our reading this week. If you've been reading through the Bible with us as a church, it's in your reading this week. Uh, and it's a Bible story that can help us understand the moral dimensions of our anger and how we can respond with it. The story was written thousands of years ago, and yet it speaks into our cultural moment right now in a way that, as if it's like a front page story in the Oregonian. It's the Old Testament story we know of as Jonah. Now, if you grew up going to church, you're likely very familiar with the basic outline of the story of Jonah because it was a Sunday school favorite, right? And for good reasons. It's a wonderful, well written story, and it has mythic qualities. But even if you didn't grow up going to church and you know nothing about the Bible, you probably know something about the story of Jonah, especially that part about the big fish, because it's kind of, it's woven into the very fabric of our culture. The story revolves around a real person named Jonah who served as a prophet of God to the nation of Israel about 850 years before Christ. We don't learn much about Jonah himself from the book, but we can understand where Jonah fits into the historical narrative of the nation of Israel because he's actually mentioned in one of the historical books, 2 Kings, which is also in our reading this week. The reference is in 2 Kings 14, beginning in verse 23, where we read this. Jeroboam II, the son of Jehoash, began to rule over Israel in the 15th year of King Amaziah's reign in Judah. He, re he reigned in Samaria 41 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He reigned in Samaria 41 years. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led, sorry, he refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Jeroboam II recovered, recovered the territories of Israel between Lebo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, and here we go, had promised through Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So what I want to do this morning is I want to quickly summarize the story of Jonah. I'm going to count on the fact that you likely know, again, the basic outline of the story. But then I want to focus in on how this story speaks specifically to this conversation about enemies and anger. So according to the Second Kings passage, the prophet Jonah spoke to the nation of Israel on behalf of God. Now that part's not surprising. That's what prophets did. But at the beginning of the story of the book of Jonah, it has an interesting twist on that. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now, if you're not up on your ancient Near East history and geography, you should know that Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Assyria was a powerful nation that was east of Israel. Not only was this not Israel that, that God was asking Jonah to go speak to, uh, it was one of Israel's most despised enemies. And Jonah was not at all pleased with the assignment that God gave him. In fact, he was so displeased, he headed in the exact opposite direction. In fact, as far as he could go in the exact opposite direction. I, I googled this. I used Google Maps to find this just so you can know and made this. Not really, but... Anyway, so, so in Israel, and we have Gath Hefer, that's where, that's where Jonah was from, and he was commanded to go to Assyria, which was out there to the east, but no, 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 he said he, said he got on a ship headed to Tarshish, way out as far, basically as far away as he could go. Now, not long into this trip, we, God caused a storm to rise up, and there was a storm so violent that everyone on the ship thought that they were going to die. And feeling desperate, the crew members, they basically began crying out to every god they could think of. Now, meanwhile, Jonah was in the bottom of the ship. He was kind of just hanging out. And they went out and they found out. It's like he didn't seem at all surprised by this or bothered. And they got mad at him. And, and they said, what are you doing down here? And then Jonah led what we might call a come to Yahweh moment. <laughs> he explained that the god he served was lord over not only all creation, but lord over the storm. And in fact, if they threw him overboard, the storm would stop. 
Now, I don't know about you, I haven't tried that as an evangelism strategy. (laughs) I'd rather not, but that was Jonas. And so in utter desperation, they followed his instructions, threw him overboard, and indeed the seas calmed. In fact, the change was so sudden and profound, the crew members actually pledged their lives to Yahweh. The evangelism worked, and they they did so. But meanwhile, in the story, as, as we're most famous for, Jonah is then swallowed up by that big fish. Now, all that happens in chapter one. I mean, this is a fast clipped story as you read through it. Chapter two, then Jonah has his come to Yahweh moment in the belly of the fish. And he responded by writing, this is what Hebrew writers did. He responded by writing a psalm, a song of thanksgiving for God's deliverance, even though it wasn't a very pleasant deliverance. And in fact, it was so unpleasant that chapter two ends with him being vomited back up onto the beach back in Israel. Right, And then chapter 3 begins with basically the same way chapter 1 begins. Go to Nineveh and, and, and preach the message that I have for you to preach. And this time Jonah decided it was a pretty good idea. And so chapter 3, he goes to Nineveh. He proclaims God's impending judgment. But in a wonderful, unexpected, dramatic twist in the story, these Ninevites, far from God, living evil ways, actually responded to the message with sorrow, with repentance. And then the end of chapter 3 ends with an unexpected and quite frankly loaded sentence. In verse 10, it reads this. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind. That's a whole sermon in that phrase right there. He did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Now, to the casual reader of the story, this is good news. Wow, a whole city saved from destruction? God changed his mind to save them? Awesome, this is excellent, right? But not to Jonah. In fact, chapter 4 begins with this dramatic sentence. This change of plans, God changing his mind, in other words, greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. And why was Jonah angry? Well, he explains it, makes it loud and clear. Verses 2 and 3, he said, He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Wow, that's pretty angry. So here we learn Jonah's motive for running away in the first place. He knew the character of God. He knew how good was God was. And he did not want his enemies benefiting from God's character. He didn't want that at all. He wanted them dead. He wanted them to pay. And if they weren't going to die, then he wanted to die. Before you criticize Jonah, you need to understand that if anyone deserved to be condemned as enemies, it would be the Assyrians. They were unmatched in their cruelty. Just just to give you some context, archaeologists have unearthed large stone panels from the ruins of Assyrian palaces, depicting the aftermath of conquests of their enemies. I've got a couple of them that I put up here, and you can find a lot of these on the internet. So here's a picture of the Assyrians, and then one of their enemies is being dismembered, the parts of their body being cut off. I want you to notice here is there's one part of the body they didn't cut off, and that was the right hand, so they could shake it as the person was dying. Uh, We have another one here, uh, and it depicts these men, these enemies, being laid out and being flayed alive, the skin taken off of their body while they are still alive. Now, the Syrians were not only cruel, they were proud of their cruelty. Archaeologists have also found writings from Assyrian kings, including this one by some guy I'm not going to even try to pronounce. It says here, I built a pillar over his city, this enemy king's city gate, and I flayed all the chiefs who had revolted, and I covered the pillar with their skin. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled upon the pillar 
on stakes, and others I bound to stakes and round about the pillar. And I cut off the limbs of the officers and the royal officers who had rebelled. Many captives from among them I burned with fire, and many I took as living captives. From, from some I cut off their noses, their ears, their fingers, and many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of the living and another of the heads. And I bound their heads to tree trunks round the city. Their young men and maidens I burned with fire. I mean, even sitting here thousands of years later, reading this depiction, we have a visceral response of revulsion. I mean, we're like Jonah. I mean, right? If that's our enemy, we want him dead. We want him to pay. Bringing it into more modern context, this would, God, the thought of God offering mercy and compassion and loyal love to people like that, that would be like offering mercy and compassion to Al-Qaeda, to Osama bin Laden after the Twin Towers. Or, to begin a little closer, to Vladimir Putin and the others leading the current destruction, unwanted destruction, undeserved destruction of, the, of Ukraine. And when you think of enemies like that, we want them dead. And of course, the angry reaction doesn't only come when thinking about historical or, or geopolitical enemies. No, it's any enemy. And my friends, we, any enemy, we, we, are, we have a body visceral response to anyone who, become, who gets in the way of what we believe is necessary for our sense of safety and security. That's the reaction that we have. We also have, we have leaders and influencers who are skilled at manipulating that visceral response and casting those who think differently than us as enemies. For example, you re read anything that's going on in the news and you see how groups and leaders quickly declare others, those that disagree with them, as Nazis or fascists, right? Because we all know it's okay to hate a Nazi, it's okay to punish a Nazi. Those are enemies. But that's not who God is. That's not what God does. We see this in God's response to Jonah's anger. It's found in chapter 4, verse 4. The Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Now, it's easy to read this maybe with a little sarcasm or demeaning in some way, right? But that's not who God is. That's not who Jonah just described God as, merciful, compassion, loyal love. No. What we need to see here is rather than chastising Jonah, God is patiently welcoming him into an interaction, into a dialogue that then goes on through the course of chapter 4. And that interaction, it revolves around anger, enemies, and justice. At a basic level, anger is for confronting enemies, absolutely, and it's for working to justice. That's what anger is for. It's for working justice. So God's question to Jonah in verse 4 gets at the heart of what justice is for and what justice is like. Now in the original language, this phrasing, is it right? Another way that we can understand that or translate it is, is it causing good? Okay, is it causing good? That's what it means to be right, not just about a right-wrong thing, but a, this is a moral question more than a legal question. And when I say, is it causing good, it's not like good like in, man, that was a good sandwich. No, no. Good as in moral good, substantive good. God is asking Jonah a rhetorical question meant to pro provoke Jonah to reflect on his anger. And for Jonah to ask himself, is your anger causing good? Is it working for good? So we can understand anger is for justice. And what justice brings or what justice accomplishes is good. And we can know from the Bible that the very character of God, that's who God is, God is good. And we see this in, in invitations, it's like one of the top invitations all through the Old Testament in particular. We see it in a number of different places, including Psalm 107, where we see this invitation, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. That's who God is. He is good. And anything good that happens in this life is but a reflection of God's goodness. And any time we are working for good, we are cooperating with God, whether we know it or not. 
So anger is designed into us by God to, to help us work toward the greatest good. That's what it's for. Well, because of sin, our anger is bent in on itself, if you will. It's distorted. And instead of working for the greater good, generally our anger is working for my good. You know, your anger is working for your good. That's why we see this, this, this statement in the New Testament letter from James. He's, he says, human anger does not produce the righteousness, or another way of translating that word would be justice of God, okay? So we can never know, we know that our anger never perfectly brings about justice. So we need to understand this idea of justice. And I, and I like to, for you to think of it in terms of comparing two types of justice. Okay, what we might call strict justice, and then we have God's justice. Now, strict justice is a transactional or cause and effect justice. You do what's right, you get rewarded. You do what's wrong, you get punished. Okay, that's strict justice. And by the way, it is written into the very fabric of the universe, including all the physical laws of the universe, like gravity. You obey gravity, life's going to go well for you. You disobey gravity, you're going to suffer consequences. And if you could think you can get around those confidence, consequences, then I invite you to join me on the roof after the sermon here, and we'll discover, anyway, right? That's strict justice. It's written into the fabric of the universe. Now, we need to understand God's justice includes strict justice, absolutely. That's why we see warnings in the Bible like the one we find in Galatians that says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. We know this, right, as you'll reap what you sow. It's written into the, again, fabric of the universe, and, and it's in the Bible. It's included as part of God's justice. And here's, what the, here's the deal with, with strict justice. This is what we want for our enemies, right? We see them doing wrong. We want God's consequence. We want consequences for them. We want them punished. Jonah got mad at God because God didn't do that. God has a different kind of justice that, again, includes strict justice but has a different qualities to it. In fact, when you think of God's justice, mercy and compassion lead the way, okay? You can think of maybe mercy and compassion in the front seat of the car, and anger is in the back seat. <laughs> it's still there. Anger is. Again, anger is necessary. It's part of working for justice, but it's in the back seat. You might think of the car as loyal love if you want to finish out the metaphor. So that's God's justice, and Jonah knew this about God. In fact, ben, that's why he got angry, because he wanted strict justice for his enemies. He didn't want God's justice, and he knew that who got what God was going to do. He knew it. And in fact, when he's describing God, he actually uses two different Hebrew words for compassion. One of them is actually translated compassionate, and the other one is maybe a little hidden. So I just want to highlight this. And so there's two different Hebrew words. One is, again, translated compassionate. And this, is, this word has a sense of, this is the, the warm, caring, gentle, enveloping kind of compassion. Probably the first one that comes to our mind. It's kind of like the warm, big hug a parent gives to a child when they hurt themselves, right? You just kind of bring them in and bring them in close. That's one kind of, that's one side of compassion. But there's another compassion, another element to compassion overall, and another compassion in this description. And it's translated eager to turn back. That's actually one Hebrew word, and it's a compassion word. This is the more challenging compassion one. This is the one, it's an agonizing compassion because it absorbs pain on behalf of another. Okay, basically, this kind of compassion it sees the consequences for strict justice, and it says, I'll pay for that. I'll cover that. This is the kind of compassion a parent shows to the rebellious teenager. This is the kind of compassion God shows to his enemies. Now, ironically, Jonah didn't want his enemies to experience God's justice, even though the only reason he was alive at this point in the story is because of God's justice, right? Right? And we often respond to, like Jonah did. We demand a strict justice for our real or perceived enemies while presuming upon God's justice for ourselves. Well, after the interaction between Jonah and God at the beginning of chapter 4, God arranged a living metaphor for Jonah in, in, in this story. You see, Jonah went off to the kind of 
outside the city and he's looking back and he's sulking and he's nursing his grievances. And while he's sitting there, a plant grows up and shades him from the hot desert sun. And then a worm comes and eats the plant and it dies. And Jonah got even more angry. You know, he's out there, old bald Jonah, and his head's getting now burned with fire, you know, because the plant died. I can relate to that. Jonah, or God responds to Jonah in, the same, in a similar way he did earlier. In verse 9, we read this. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Then God provides a searing explanation for the living metaphor and asks a closing question. And the question is laden with irony. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. And just in case you don't care about them, think of all the animals. Because we all know empathy is easier to give to animals than it is to give to our enemies. And then this, here's this question. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And that's where the story ends, with an unanswered question, which again is just a reminder, this is good literature. This is what good literature does. It's a, actually a, it's a question that brings rhetorical force and invites us as the reader to answer the question. You see, we live in a world full of tragedy, injustice, enemies, just like Jonah did. And when God wants to display his mercy and compassion, he sends his people into the tragedy, into the justice, toward the enemies with good news, the good news of his mercy and compassion. Now, personally, I'm glad Jonah's story is in the Bible because it tells an honest story of a reluctant messenger. I can relate to that. <laughs> okay, when, I, when I'm called to move toward my enemies with mercy and compassion... Yeah, I'm more likely to head the other direction as far as I can get. I mean, that's my natural response to that. And I don't think I'm the only one in the room. And the good news of Jonah's, the story we have here in Jonah, is that God is showing compassion to Jonah even as he's inviting you know, Jonah to be a part of him showing compassion through Jonah. Same for us. God shows us compassion to us even as he's inviting us to be a part of his story that he might show his compassion through us. It's hard to honestly face our anger and submit to God. And so if you're here today and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you want to live out God's ways, I just want to invite you to the following response to Jonah's story. Okay, first, I just want to honestly ask you to examine your anger. When you have angry reactions, and we have them all the time, Take the time to ponder them, to think about them. And in fact, I invite you as a, a, a great spiritual practice to do every day is at the end of the day, kind of take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, with the, invite the Spirit of God to walk back through your day, especially the emotional arc of the day. And where you had a really great moment, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His loyal love endures forever, right? But what about also those angry reactions? Pay attention to them and then Ask, who is my enemy right now? So if I'm in the middle of the anger, who is my enemy right now? If I'm looking back at my anger, who was my enemy in that situation? Then wrestle with God's rhetorical question. Is your anger or did your anger accomplish good? And then realign yourself with God's kind of justice. How can I show mercy and compassion in this moment? Or how can I go back, how can I make up for or go back to where I, who I was angry about and show that person mercy and compassion? When I was preparing this message and, and working through this, coming up with this, I knew that as I faced that, I, I, I always think of myself as I go first. Okay, when I'm preparing messages, I'm, it's usually God speaking to me, again, as much as he's going to speak through me. And thankfully, he's showing me compassion as he wants to show a message of compassion through me. And so I want to get real and raw here for a few moments. Because I have a visceral, angry reaction toward a certain, certain people, and it's especially hard in this particular month for reasons that will become clear in a few moments. So I invite you to hear what I'm about to share. Please hear it through the lens of this story of Jonah. So for a long time now, I have felt a personal call to understand and teach about God's 
view of sexuality. I firmly believe God's, that following God's design for gender and sexuality is, is preeminent for human flourishing. It's, it's he wants good for us. He wants us to enjoy what he has designed. And this means pursuing sexual expression exclusively within a covenant between one man and one woman for a lifetime. That's God's best, to enjoy the sexual expression in that environment. It also means seeking the vitality, the beauty, the wonder of human beings made as male or female. Which means God's design is good, and that means it's worthy of me pursuing it personally and defending it and working for it. Which means I'm fundamentally opposed to efforts redefining marriage and undermining gender and sexuality. Which means my anger is easily aroused toward those advocating for boundaryless sexual expression, gender fluidity, and alternative de definitions of marriage. Which means I viscerally respond to those people in any situation as my enemies when I respond with anger. Which means I am confronted... <laughs> with God's question. Is your anger, Shane, accomplishing good? And you know what? More often than not, far more often than not, the answer is no. No, it's selfish. Which means I am called to align myself with God's justice, which means putting compassion and mercy in the front seat and turning from my anger reactions. Now, please understand, this doesn't mean acquiescing. It doesn't mean redefining what is good. It does mean courageously advocating for God's best and warning people of the dangers of indulging sin. It also means extending gracious hospitality toward those who disagree with me. God makes no room for rejection, apathy, hate, or condemnation. There's no room for that. Now, this is not an invitation for me to pretend. Rather, it's an invitation to trust God, even when I don't agree or even when I don't understand. And we can know from the story of Jonah that God is patient with our disobedience. He is kind in his correction. He welcomes our complaints. And he continually invites us into his story of mercy and compassion. That's my journey and I'm still on it. What about you? How do you want to step into that and seek God's best to you and through you? There's a couple other characters in this story. I didn't spend a lot of time with them, but I imagine they speak to some that are here today or maybe tuning in online. You think of the, sh the crew on the ship, and you think of the Ninevites, and maybe you're here today, maybe you relate to them. Maybe like the crew members, uh, your, your life is pretty much a, sh a shipwreck waiting to happen right now. And you're wondering, is there a God who cares enough to rescue you? Or maybe you're like the Ninevites, and you know you're a long ways from God. <laughs> you're a long ways from God's best. To those two groups of people, this story offers both a warning and a hopeful message. The warning is... Strict justice exists. There's consequences for actions. And you know what? Perfect obedience is what strict justice requires. Perfect obedience. You need to perfectly obey gravity or you're going to hurt. And the same with God's moral laws. Perfect obedience is required. That's the warning. The hopeful message is the God who created all this, the God who is superintends over all of this, is ready to forgive, to welcome, to extend grace, no matter how far you've gone and no matter how long you've been gone. And it should, should come as no surprise to us that Jesus, when he was talking about why he came, one of the images he used is he said, pay attention to the story of Jonah. In fact, in his words, they're found in Matthew chapter 12. 
This is Jesus speaking. He says, For as Jonah was in the belly of that great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man, which is Jesus talking about himself there, be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone far greater than Jonah is here. And you refuse to repent. My friends, someone far greater than Jonah is still here. He rose from the dead. In fact, just like that place of death, the the belly of the fish, was turned into a place of salvation for the people of Nineveh as part of God's plan, so that tomb turned into a hopeful message for all who are ready to respond. You can receive God's compassion today because Jesus is alive. And with that that painful compassion tells you, I've already paid the price for for, for it. I've already paid the price for your disobedience. You can turn and return at any point in time. And that's the invitation of Jonah to you today. Will you turn from whatever path of self-salvation you are on, believing you can save yourself, you can do it on your own, and would you respond to God's initiative through Jesus? Would you pray with me? And so, Father, we probably all of us in the room, including I know myself here, we had visceral reactions to this message today, to your story through Jonah. Maybe for some there's an angry response even to the message. Maybe for some there's a fearful response. But would your mercy and compassion be front and center? Would we hear that message of loyal love and would we respond to it no matter where we are with Jesus? And so if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to think of the ways that God is calling you to move toward an enemy, whether that's a real or perceived enemy, with courage and with compassion. Join God in his, message, in his mission. For those of you who may be like, like the, the, the crew members on that ship or, or the Ninevites, and you are hearing God's message to turn and discover who that God is and the loyal love that's available to you, Whatever, wherever you are, would you turn and return to God right now, the hopeful message of Jesus, and we pray in that name, amen. And we have that opportunity even now, as we often do, uh, we're going to respond in song, as well as during this first song, the tables are open, where we have communion, the bread that represents Jesus' body broken for your sins, his blood spilled to cover uh, your sins. You can respond in hope uh, here, even during this next song, and invite you to do so now. Respond to God's message to you personally. Old things have passed away, your love has stayed the same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone, things that we thought Breathing in life again, you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song, Jesus. We Yes, sir.
Church, it was such a joy to worship with you guys this morning. Um, if you need prayer, if you need somebody to talk to about a particular challenge you're going through or maybe somebody to celebrate with about a victory, um, there's going to be people up here to talk to you. So please take advantage of that um, space to, to talk to somebody. Otherwise, we're going to have the cruising out there for Father's Day, uh, and that's going to be in place of family fellowship. So we love you guys. Have a good week. <laughs>